Awesome. Looks like everyone has started to join in. A couple of people are still connecting their audio. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Cyber Threat Series around uh, next generation uh, cloud security. We're going to give it about another minute or two. Just wait for any other uh, any other people to uh, to join in and then we'll kick off. So if you do not have a coffee, water, tea, or whichever beverage uh, that takes your fancy. I don't know if it's uh, late enough in the day for some of the other type of beverages. You've got about a minute to, to go grab them before the, uh, before the session starts. Good afternoon to those who have just joined. Uh, probably going to give it about another 30 seconds until we kick off. So just bear with. Um, make sure you're, you're nice and comfortable. And uh, yeah, the session will be on the way before we know it. Right, so I think we've given it a couple of minutes. Uh, I'm guessing a couple of people will probably join at last minute. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Cyber Threat Series around next generation cloud security. My name's Janara Miacho. I'm the Head of Technology Solutions Development at Bytes. Uh, I'm joined today by Paolo, um, who is one of the, who is the Cyber Intelligence Specialist from Netscope. And Paolo, I'll let you do a, a proper introduction after I've done uh, all of the housekeeping, because just like with any other job title, the job title never does it justice. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, before we kick off into the session today, of course, uh, we're just going to run through uh, a little bit of um, a little bit of housekeeping for this session. Um, so please remain muted uh, for, the, for the duration of this session. Um, if you do have questions to ask, please pop them into the chat window um, or into the chat box on uh, on Zoom. There is a dedicated allotted amount of time towards the end where we'll be going through the uh, the, the the questions in a in a Q and A type format. This session is recorded. Uh, the recording will be sent to you um, via email tomorrow morning or, or, or maybe the afternoon or maybe even a little bit before then. But it will be recorded. If you do miss out on, on, on any parts, uh, you know, you'll definitely be able to, to catch up. Finally, and this is probably the most important one, this session is interactive, right? There are going to be a couple of poll questions uh, popping up throughout the uh, session. Uh, you know, please take part. It does help to, uh, you know, to drive the session, uh, you know, and the and, and the conversation points um, that we have today. No, anyway, that's it for housekeeping. Very simple set of rules. Um, so let's go on in terms of the, uh, you know, the timeline for the uh, for the three day um, series uh, that we have on. So currently we're at the final session of the day. Uh, we do have Netscope in with us today to talk around, uh, you know, combating cloud threats with next generation um, cloud security. But we also have some great sessions lined up tomorrow um, in terms of talking around managing risk, responding to threats. Uh, and in terms of the final day, we're gonna look at some of the security capabilities uh, within the Microsoft stack. Um, the Azure Sentinel one on the Microsoft side is actually one that I'll be presenting. So it'd be great to see you know, a number of you there um, on day three. But in terms of today, we are here to talk about Netscope. I'm definitely not going to hijack the session just to promote myself. That would uh, that would de definitely be unfair. So, in terms of Netscope, uh, as a you know, as a really quick introduction, Netscope are a key partner of Bytes. Um, you know, we've introduced Netscope to you know uh, you know loads of different customers to help address uh, you know challenges around web application uh, and data uh, security challenges. Part of my role at Bytes is actually to run CIS gap analysis sessions. 
Uh, and you know, from these uh, from these sessions, we tend to see gaps within the the DLP and data side, uh, as well as the web side. And you know, majority of the time. Uh, you know, Netscope is a recommendation that we make within that area. So we do partner very closely with Netscope. They've got a very good uh, offering to, to take us through today. But I do not want to steal any of Paolo's thunder anymore. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually hand over now to the significantly more intelligent Italian that's, uh, that's on this call. And he actually comes with a working and, fun a working and functional Italian accent. So I'm going to hand over to Paolo. Uh, Paolo. Stage Thank yours. you. Thank you so much, Gennaro. And uh, okay, let me share my screen. Uh, okay, perfect. Uh, let me know if you can see it. One second. Okay, do you see my screen in presentation mode? Uh, yep, that's coming through fine for me, Paolo. Okay, awesome. So my name is Paolo Passeri, uh, Italian name, obviously, and I'm in Netscope since uh, September 2017, nearly four years. And my background is uh, in advanced security. I've been working in this space for the last uh, probably um, since uh, 2010. So it was a long ago, 11 years, more or less. And within Netscope, I'm a kind of subject matter expert for our threat intel, uh, threat protection capabilities. And uh, my role is across EMEA to help the sales engineers to uh, leverage the, the capabilities and the power of our technology. Today, uh, we have this session divided into two parts, basically. Before, we will explore the, the current uh, threat landscape. We will see how cloud, uh, the growing adoption of uh, cloud services, also the dispersion of the workforce and other elements are characterizing the threat landscape in this particular moment. I would say that this uh, situation has accelerated some trends that we were already seeing but obviously the adoption of cloud services is absolutely reshaping the threat landscape this is also evident by our report basically we uh, issue a, a report that provides a snapshot of cloud threats more or less every six months the last edition was released on uh, yeah more or less every two quarters the last edition was released on july and uh, these are some interesting figures from our report for example now the 85 percent of the corporate traffic is related to cloud activity most importantly according to the data that we collect anonymously from our customers the 68 percent of the malware is now delivered from cloud applications and we will see some examples later on this presentation 66 percent of this malware is delivered via cloud storage apps and in fact uh, this is a spoiler uh, Let's say that uh, Google Drive and the OneDrive fight for the first rank on the unwelcome list of the most exploited cloud services to deliver malicious content. And also 43% of malware is delivered by, via Office Docs. And I believe these are all dots that are connected because obviously the distribution of the workforce uh, uh, means that collaboration tools are very important. Collaboration tools are used, for example, to exchange uh, documents and obviously malicious actors are trying to monetize these trends. This is just the, the, the list of the most exploited cloud categories to distribute malicious content and this is, uh, these are the apps uh, exploited the most for the same purpose. Uh, this is taken from a report that we release on a monthly basis that gives an idea of what's going on, not only in terms of cloud, but uh, in general for the threat landscape. So the business challenges that organizations must face in this period are obviously to protect the distributed workforce because the physical perimeter as we knew it 
doesn't exist anymore. We enable, uh, we need to enable web and cloud safely, but I would say we need to enable all the traffic safely because the users can access directly the, the their uh, um, cloud app applications from their endpoint. Unfortunately, in too many cases, the endpoint is also used for uh, personal utilization. And so this means basically that one browser session can access a corporate service and in, within the same browser into another tab, the user might have a personal session. So potentially it could become a kind of Trojan horse for the attackers. And then the 83% of users have personal applications on company de uh, devices that, as I mentioned before, provide a potential door to attack their attackers. And of course, <laughs> This uh, new uh, uh, paradigm, this uh, new normal, has to deal with the old problems, which is the uh, proliferation, the growth of malware. Every day, basically, there are more or less 500,000 new samples, and also 83% of phishing pages, for example, use HTTPS. So uh, a an effective security technology must be able to deal with encrypted traffic and also must, must have multiple layers of uh, multiple engines able to deal with malware, evasive malware, or malware that can't be detected by a simple signatures. So in the cloud threat landscape, we see the dispersion of the workforce. We see the growing adopt adoption of cloud services that if on one hand provide uh, an important, uh, important tools for the organizations to retain productivity and continuity in this uh, complicated period, in the same time can be exploited by the attackers and also are able to evade traditional security technologies. Then, of course, if you think about the pandemic, basically, or when the uh, lockdowns were the different lockdowns across the world were de declared, basically, or organizations found themselves in the situation of giving access to internal services without taking too much care about the security implications. This means, for example, that they started services to, to publish, to expose services more uh, for a productivity intent rather than making them secure. And obviously, this has had a huge cost in terms of misconfigurations and also leaving services potentially exposed to the attackers themselves. The last factor is what I've called the perfect storm. I have built a very interesting timeline where basically I took note of all the critical vulnerabilities exploited by the attackers that hit remote access or internet exposed services. It's a very nasty trend that started at the end of 2019 in the wrongest possible moment because obviously shortly after organizations had to rely on services like VPNs or had to expose internal services and just in this critical moment some uh, very high profile zero days were discovered and exploited by the at attackers and are behind some of the most uh, destructive attacks that we have experienced in the last months. If we look at the dispersion of the workforce, according to the statistics that we collect, this is a chart that uh, uh, arrives until March, but we have a most up-to-date version in our Cloud and Threat Report July uh, edition. Basically, the 70% of the workforce continued, continues to be uh, remote, basically, in contrast with the 30% at the beginning of the pandemic. Obviously, 
there is no need to repeat all the implications basically users not protected any longer by the physical perimeter users that have personal services personal applications on their corporate de devices users that share their corporate devices with other members of the family or maybe use their personal devices for work purposes of course these this trend is uh, augmenting, is amplifying dramatically the attack surface because one endpoint can be compromised and offer a gate to the attackers. This is one of the reasons why, as we will see later, it's a new security model is needed that basically follows the user, follows the data, and enforces the security controls at the access edge. The growing adoption of cloud services. This, is, this has been and is being a great advantage for organizations because they can retain the business continuity, the productivity, they can boost the collaboration. But in the same time, there is also the other side of the coin. Even the cyber criminals have seen that these cloud services have offer powerful tools to launch more evasive campaigns able to evade traditional security uh, technology. An example is given by the kill chain. This is the standard kill chain, uh, is uh, the Lockheed Martin model. So it's quite a consolidated uh, model to to represent the phases involved in a cyber attack. Basically, it's not the only model, but maybe it's quite simple and, uh, and uh, emphasizes clear stages. This model has changed a lot since the advent of the cloud services, because for example, during the reconnaissance phase, the attackers try to look now for configuration errors, try to look for exposed data, exposed API, try to gather breadcrumbs of information that maybe they can use in the next stages of the attack. For example, I can, if I'm targeting a certain or, or organization, I can craft a DNS query to uh, try to guess if this organization is using a specific cloud service. And why this inf information is important? Because I can use this information in the next phase of the attack. I know that my target is using Office 365, is using Google Workplace, is using Box, is using Dropbox, is using any service. I can create in the weaponization phase a phishing page that completely mimics the original login page used by the organization. And this is, in a nutshell, what happens in the next stage of the, of the, of the uh, kill chain, where basically the attackers weaponize what they have collected in the previous stage, or maybe they just weaponize today a cloud service. We call it cloud phishing. I will show you an example of how easy it is to create a phishing page on Google Forms, basically. And not only I have a very powerful and stable environment to host my malicious infrastructure without uh, taking care of the operational burden of all the steps involved in setting up a malicious in infrastructure, but in the same time, I can leverage the tools provided into the platform to send out the phishing emails. I can create a phishing form and I can use Gmail to send these phishing forms to my victims. This is an example of how a cloud service can be weaponized. And it's also an example of how what I have weaponized can be delivered directly to the users. So basically, uh, we, I can use the cloud service to deliver my payload, or I can simply use an hybrid approach where basically I deliver the link to a malicious payload hosted on a cloud service via a traditional email. We call these kinds of campaigns hybrid threats. Or even I can use a compromised cloud account to send an attack. 
Because in this case, if I'm able to compromise an Office 365 account, and for example, I use Exchange to send my malicious emails, they will bypass the email security filters. And that's another problem, obviously. Cloud services are not only weaponized by the attackers, but also it's important for the organizations to protect them because they are now a very coveted target by the attackers. The exploit basically is uh, in the cloud era with the exploit uh, phase we mean the fact that this traffic is too often whitelisted too many organizations don't understand completely the implications of the what we call the shared responsibility model basically where the cloud service provider take cares of the security of the cloud whereas the the customer takes care of the security in the cloud Sometimes too many organizations assume that a cloud service is, se is secure only because Microsoft, Microsoft is trusted, Google is trusted, Box is trusted, the cloud service provider is trusted. And consequently, they don't apply to this traffic the same security controls they apply to the rest of the traffic. We have seen cases of malware able to bypass completely the security controls because it was served from a cloud service that was bypassed since it was considered trusted inside the organization. The install phase occurs in the endpoint, but we'll see later that we have the possibility to integrate our platform with endpoint technologies. and. In the callback phase, basically, once the endpoint has been compromised, the, it, the malware will connect to a command and control that can be hosted in the cloud uh, as well. This is the case, for example, of a malware called Slab. Slab is the combination of Slack and GitHub because obviously this malware used these two services for the command and control infrastructure. We have built a, a prototype of such a malware called the Sazi Boy that we use to raise awareness and to show which could be the, the consequences if a cloud service is abused for command and control. And finally, there's the persistence phase. In the age of cloud, this means that once the attackers compromised a cloud account like Office 365 or G Suite, they can, or maybe a YAS account like AWS or Google Cloud Platform, they can uh, play with the services hosted in the same cloud service. They can persist inside the cloud infrastructure and maybe also use the compromised accounts to launch other attacks. Traditionally, the, the phases between weaponization and callback are involved when the attack is opportunistic. Is if the attack has really uh, if the attackers are really motivated, they will perform a reconnaissance and they will persist within the or organization. And of course, the duration of the attack can differ according to the nature. The uh, preparing an attack could take months if the attackers are really really motivated. The execution takes minutes or seconds, and again, they can persist for months within the, the, the compromised infrastructure. The first two phases happen at the infrastructure level, that today is often the cloud. The, uh, the, the, the delivery and exploit in the network, the install in the endpoint, the callback in the network, and the persistence as well in the infrastructure that to today is the cloud. That being said, I would go with the first poll of the day. So you will see a poll now. Please send your answers. How many threat alerts do you receive on average per month? Uh, interesting figures coming up. And of course, <laughs> I can spoil you that the worst scenario is unfortunately <laughs> too often the most common. Uh, come on, you have uh, um, some time to vote if you want.
Okay. So basically, yes, the the fifty percent of the of the the the, the respondents uh, experiences more than ten alerts uh, per 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 month, which is obviously the worst choice uh, between the options of the poll, which is obviously kind of expected because in this uh, new normal, basically, the perimeter of the uh, uh, enterprise follows the users and as we mentioned earlier, they are not protected anymore by the physical perimeter, for example. So let's uh, recap quickly the typical attack chain. Uh, basically, um, so uh, in a typical web chain, basically the user visits a compromise page. The compromise page redirects the user to what is normally called an exploit kit landing page. The exploit kit landing page is a domain registered on purpose by the attacker where a piece of malicious software called exploit kit will probe the vulnerabilities in the endpoint and if one vulnerability that can be exploited is found will exploit this very same vulnerability to inject the malicious payload and to exfiltrate data to a command and control infrastructure in case of the hybrid threats for the web basically the user connects to a compromise page as well my page will redirect the use to an exploit kit landing page. The exploit kit landing page injects the malicious payload, and the malicious payload connects, in this case, to a weaponized cloud service like AWS or Google Drive or Dropbox. Uh, there was, a, for example, a, a, a backdoor uh, called uh, um, a Drop Control, uh, a Drop control because it is characterized by the fact of exploiting Dropbox for uh, DB control, if I'm not wrong, uh, ex exploiting Dropbox for the command and control infrastructure. In this case, the attack vector is traditional, but a cloud service is exploited in the kill chain, for example, to distribute the payload or to host the command and control infrastructure. In the typical email attack chain, the user receives a malicious email. The malicious email has a malicious attachment or a link. This attachment uh, or the link will, the attachment will download the second stage payload. A macro executes this payload and basically the payload, once it is executed, will export, will exfiltrate the data to the command and control infrastructure. The email can contain an attachment, and despite all the disclaimers, the users unfortunately tend to open the attachments. Are you sure do you want to enable the macros? Are you really sure you want to execute this file? Unfortunately, yes. But in other, uh, sometimes the email can also uh, have uh, links to fake documents or uh, the malware and of course once the malware is executed the attack goes the same way in the hybrid threat again the initial attack vector is a traditional it's an email in this case the malware payload is hosted on a cloud service like a google drive or OneDrive, basically which provides uh, legitimacy to the connection to the attack and the malware is downloaded, is executed, and will connect to a command and control that can be hosted on a generic domain or in a cloud service. An example of this modus operandi is a malware dropper called the GU Loader, very popular during the pandemic because basically GU Loader was used to distribute a, a Trojan called the Formbook uh, in disguise of a basically a document issued by the World Health Organization providing at the beginning of the pandemic guidelines on how to behave safely during the coronavirus outbreak. But the GU loader basically is characterized by the fact that it can connect to a cloud service like 
Google Drive or OneDrive and encrypt and execute the malicious payload. During the pandemic, it was used to distribute this Trojan, Trojan cold form book able to exfiltrate sensitive data such as clipboard content and browsing data. Spear phishing, the user receives uh, an email the email has a malicious link, the user clicks on the link and ends up submitting his corporate credentials into the phishing page. In the cloud phishing, the modus operandi is similar at the beginning. Everything starts with an email, but the difference is that in this case, the cloud service is hosted in a trusted cloud service. It can be uh, uh, Google, Dri uh, Google Drive, it can be uh, Microsoft, and the user sees a legitimate domain, a legitimate certificate, and ends up submitting his credentials into the phishing page. Let me show you quickly an example. This is a real phishing page, okay, post Luxembourg. You can see that it is hosted on uh, G Suite. Uh, sorry, on uh, Microsoft Excel online. And basically, yes, the user uh, can uh, uh, seize a legitimate uh, cert, uh, domain, a legitimate certificate. Even if uh, there's a, a clear banner, never give out your password, unfortunately, this is not enough. As I said before, this is a real a uh, phishing page built on a cloud service that you can find on a URL scan just submitting a query as simple as this. And these are all examples of phishing pages built uh, with the, the same technique. And sometimes they are taken down, taken down, sometimes they're not, but uh, yeah, they are definitely there. Okay, so this is just a, some, these are just some statistics statistics you can see that now as i show i told at the beginning the 68 percent of malware is delivered via the cloud from a cloud service and the uh, the percentage is quite stable is around 77 79 7, uh, 67 69 71 68 and also malicious office docs are always around 40 percent this is just an example of a, 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 let's say a, 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 a timeline of some attacks that I have collected exploiting cloud services in the kill chain. This is taken from my blog. I have a personal blog where I collect all these informations. Uh, and in my blog, uh, there's an interactive timeline with uh, um, operations with campaign with the campaigns exploiting the cloud services. And why cloud services are so compelling? Why the majority of the malware of the malicious payload now is delivered from the cloud? Because they offer simplified hosting. Setting up an infrastructure is a, a non-trivial task for the attackers. They can commit mistakes. They can leave traces that can, that can be found by the, the good guys and used to take down the, the campaign. This is not gonna happen with a cloud service because the attackers can don't need to perform specific op operations specific tasks for the hosting they can they have a resilient infrastructure if if a campaign is taken down they can immediately spin up a new tenant and launch the same campaign so the environment is much more resilient and agile than a traditional domain the traffic is whitelisted in most cases because the service is considered trusted by too many organizations. Then traditional technologies don't have the context. If I'm if I am a traditional web security gateway, I can see the traffic going to OneDrive, for example, but I'm not able to recognize if the traffic is going to a corporate instance of OneDrive or to a malicious to a rogue instance of OneDrive abused by the attackers or compromised. And if I need to have OneDrive allowed for my users and I don't have a technology that is able to identify the context, this traffic 
basically will be impossible to differentiate from malicious instances of the same service. No SSL TLS inspection. On-prem technologies don't scale enough. I've, he I've heard with my ears customers telling we have a specific proxy, for example, for Office 365 because we can't afford to inspect this traffic. Our on-prem technology doesn't have enough horsepower. So basically, we can, we, we can uh, inspect uh, this, uh, this uh, traffic and so the traffic will flow without a TLS inspection. Then, and we have seen this before, if, for example, I host a phishing page on a legitimate service, the user will see a legitimate domain and a legitimate certificate. It's now time for the second poll question. So, what's your main concern with unmanaged cloud applications? Lack of visibility, malicious payload distribution, corporate data exfiltration, all of the above. Okay, we still have 20 seconds to vote or so. Let's see. Uh, it looks like even in this case, the worst scenario is the most common. Yes, we are. Yeah, the se according to the 75% of you, basically, the main concern is all of the above. So lack of visibility, malicious payload distribution and corporate data exfiltration. But despite these cloud services are exploited to launch malicious campaigns, there's always a detail that can show a misplaced detail that can show uh, the maliciousness of the of the campaign. So watch out not to fall into the trap. Of, of course, I love cycling and I didn't resist from putting this uh, this uh, this slide. Normally, when I do pre pre presentation, there's always at least one slide about cycling and another slide about. Uh, Alpha Romeos, which is another thing that I love a lot. Anyway, there is always a misplaced detail that reveals the intentions of the attackers. This is a similar page as the one we have seen before. And we have seen how, for example, the domain is legitimate, the certificate is legitimate. There is also a disclaimer that never that invites to never submit the password. In this case, obviously, it's pretty simple, but there are other cases where basically the layout could be more realistic, like uh, this one. But again, there is always a misplaced detail because in this case, basically, a login page for Office 365 is hosted on a Google site, basically, which is unrealistic. In other cases, the attackers can also be more uh, creative. Uh, this is another page hosted on Google Cloud Storage, and you can see how uh, curated is the phishing page. Even in this case, there's a misplaced detail because, for example, I have a phishing, a Microsoft page hosted on Google. Maybe this could be more tricky because basically, there's a Google sign-in page hosted on a Google service. So in this case, basically, the user can be tricked. But obviously, why should you believe to a, a login page that offers multiple services and is always hosted on Google? And this is my favorite one. This is a real campaign. This is a Google form used to mimic a LinkedIn login page. Here, everything is basically, uh, I would say, misplaced because the layout is very poor. Basically, the page is hosted on Google. And uh, I mean, there's also the disclaimer. There's not even the, the password field because, of course, Google checks for password 
for the term password into the form. So basically, this is quite unrealistic, but trust me, that's not enough from preventing these attacks from being successful. So basically, this is uh, what happens today. Basically, we focus the controls on the traffic that doesn't need to be scanned, and the malicious traffic flows uh, uh, uninspected throughout the, through the traditional security technologies. By the way, if you recognize this movie, write it in the chat window, and then at the end, I will tell you if you were right or not. Obviously, I love movies from the 80s, and this is a very famous comedy. Actually, it's a series of comedy from the, the 80s. Exactly, exactly. It's Airplane, exactly. But actually, it's the Airplane 2. But absolutely, you are right. It belongs to the Airplane series. OK, sorry. Then another danger we have today are exposed services. This is, uh, these are some data that we gathered. And you can see how many um, uh, services are left exposed on the on public cloud and also on-prem. Basically, according to our report, more than 35% of cloud workloads are exposed on the internet with, uh, within AWS, Azure, and GCP. And RDP is, is exposed in the 8.3% of cases. And this explains why brute force attacks are very common today. And basically, the consequences, as we will see soon, can be very uh, bitter. And um, this is also the reason why today there's a new uh, a class of cyber criminals called uh, uh, initial access brokers that uh, accumulate these compromised accounts and outsource them to ransomware gangs, threats, uh, state-sponsored actors, and so on. Vulnerable le legacy technologies under pressure. This is another example of uh, of uh, 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 um, critical vulnerabilities exploited in the wild, targeting uh, remote access and uh, technologies and internet exposed services. And you can compare the occurrence of these vulnerabilities with the declaration of the pandemic. This trend started in 2019 and unfortunately it's continuing in these days because these are the top routinely exploited CVEs in 2020. And you can see that in five cases, these are vulnerabilities that appeared in the previous timeline. As I said before, this happened in the worst possible moment because now is the moment where we need these technologies the most. And if you look, if you read the same alert, the, the, it's a, a joint alert between the FBI, the UK, and NCSC, uh, and the Australian uh, CERT, uh, you will see that in 2020, 2021, so far, unfortunately, the situation hasn't changed a lot. And the consequences can be very bitter, as I said before. There are criminals selling corporate network access. There are initial access brokers. Uh, they look for VPN bugs, uh, are the unprotected RDP accesses. And in most cases, these uh, um, vulnerabilities were behind some uh, high profile attacks that happened in the last months. So, a new security stack is needed. Netscope provides a layered protection that is able to detect malware that is also resistance, resistant to evasion. We, have a, we, de we, leverage, um, we leverage machine learning, we leverage sandboxing te technologies. Most importantly, we have built an architecture that is able to inspect all traffic at scale, regardless if it's encrypted, it's, if it's encrypted or not. And basically, we released a, a few days ago a service level agreement for the latency 
of encrypted traffic. This is something that is absolutely revolutionary and we are the first company offering such a similar SLA. We can scan multiple file formats, including office documents that account for the majority of malware di distribution. This is just a, a, sum a summary of our threat protection capabilities. We have uh, a, 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 a standard threat protection license that is able to deploy signature-based AV, is able to exchange threat intelligence with external technologies. We also offer, uh, basically, uh, we have an IPS, actually, we have an, we call it CTAP, but it's an IPS engine, network IPS engine that inspects the traffic and protects the clients from uh, 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 drive-by attacks, exploits, etc. We have what we call the fast scan or standard threat protection that is able to uh, leverage a signature based antivirus to exchange a threat intelligence with other sources and so on. And also we have uh, the advanced threat protection or deep scan that has an additional set of engines dedicated to detect malware that for which a signature is not available. So we deploy machine learning, we deploy, we, um, we use machine learning, we use a sandboxing, we use pre-execution, advanced heuristics, and so on. We use, we make use of multiple machine learning detectors. An example is for the, the classification and the real-time block of portable exec, uh, executables. We analyze features such as the size of the file, the entropy of the file, the entropy of the first 1000 bytes, the, the unigram and the biogram of the file and the first 1000 bytes. But this is done without any previous knowledge of the file, according to our machine learning model that we have trained with millions of malicious and benign samples. We also use machine learning classifiers for office documents. Uh, we analyze uh, more than 100 features inside a document. Basically, for example, if the document is connecting to another domain to download a payload, if it's executing this payload, etc. And the results are absolutely uh, outstanding. We have a 99.64% detection rate with a 0.1% false positives and uh, and also we have uh, introduced a new technology that is able to scan the content into web pages while while the user is browsing like uh, javascript text uh, etc to look for alien content injected into a page turning this page into an attack vector uh, the CTAP is our IPS. We have 20,000 signatures against the uh, public CVEs. We are applying for the Microsoft Active Protection Program to provide uh, proactive protection against the, the vulnerabilities patched with the Patch Tuesday. And we have recently added our uh, homemade sandbox. Uh, for which we will soon add the new exciting features like, for example, the Mitri attack mapping uh, in, uh, in our detection reports. Today we leverage two sandboxes. One is a bare metal sandbox and the other one is based on a custom hypervisor. The latest addition to our arsenal is the remote browser isolation. You are probably familiar with this technology, but basically, in our case, we perform a targeted RBI. We scan the content to the security category or, for example, to the uncategorized category, and we decouple the browsing process between the user and the end server. Basically, the user uh, sees a version of the page where the malicious content has been stripped by the remote browser isolation engine. As I said before, we perform pixel rendering where basically we strip all the website content that is that potentially is malicious, such as JavaScript, 
pictures, fonts, style sheets, uh, etc. And, and it's targeted because it's ideal for high risk targets and basically for categories, uh, for uh, uncategorized sites, newly registered domains and risky websites. This is something that can be added on top of our threat protection licenses. So we have a defense in depth architecture with multiple layers, starting from static detectors, threat intelligence, antivirus signatures, and um, um, exchange of feeds with third parties to more sophisticated dynamic uh, engines like uh, machine learning detectors for executables and office documents, sandboxing, pre-execution, uh, advanced heuristics and remote browser isolation. We have these engines, obviously. We have a multi-layered approach, but we must be able to enforce this approach in an effective way. This is possible moving the security to the edge according to what today is called the secure service edge. Today, we have seen that the average enterprise uses over 2,400 distinct cloud apps basically the 85 84 between the 84 and 85 percent of the traffic is encrypted cloud applications have overtaken the web traffic and they speak their own language which is not the traditional http language but it's the language of the api if you think about uh, a user accessing a cloud app application like OneDrive, for example, the user can access this application from a browser or from a native client, but he, he is able to perform a complex interactions like uh, creating documents, sharing the documents with other users, modifying the documents, sharing the documents with other cloud applications. Despite the HTTP remains the transport protocol, the interaction with the applications must happen via specific API. And our technology has been built natively with the intent to understand this API. We use a set of connectors that understands the, the uh, connectors that understand the specific API for thousands of cloud applications, understand the context and can enforce multiple security functions. We can understand if the traffic is going to a personal instance, to a corporate instance, and differentiate the threat protection and data protection policies accordingly. Today, as we have explained, the 85% of the traffic is composed of SaaS applications, the 5% of YAS application, and you can understand how easy is for the attackers to conceal their malicious traffic into this plethora of cloud applications. That's the reason why we embrace the SSC paradigm, the secure service edge paradigm. We have built a network of nearly 50 data centers worldwide where we steer the traffic of our customers and we enforce all the security features that we have seen previously. Next generation SWIG with this approach able to understand the language of the API, cloud firewall because now the users can access any application, even non-web from their corporate devices when they are working outside the organization, remote browser isolation, the CASB and the uh, SSPM which is basically SaaS security posture management. The CASB was the initial uh, was the initial solution for our company. Now is just an element of the framework. Public cloud security that is basically the equivalent of SSPM for the IaaS infrastructures like uh, Google Cloud Platform, AWS, and 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 Azure, where we go and check the security posture, and uh, finally zero trust network access, where basically we can safely publish internal or uh, applications hosted on the public cloud, on-prem or 
hosted on public cloud applications according to the zero trust paradigm. And finally, we can also scan the email with an inline SMTP proxy to prevent data exfiltration. Everything delivered from a single platform, controlled from a single entity, with all the security features available regardless of the access mechanism. Last but not least, our technology is uh, uh, driven by the API, so we have a very tight integration with uh, our partners in the Spectra Alliance. We can integrate with Okta for identity and access management. We can integrate with CrowdStrike via the Cloud Threat Exchange to exchange bi-directionally threat intelligence. This means that the Netscop uh, threat protection engines can take advantage uh, from the findings, from the detections made by CrowdStrike. And in the same time, CrowdStrike threat intelligence can be enriched with the detections made by Netscope. And similarly, we can integrate with Proofpoint, for example, for the inline SMTP. We can scan, we can, sorry, uh, tag a message if something, uh, if a data exfiltration is detected. And of course, uh, the Proofpoint MTA can take an action for uh, once Netscope has classified this uh, email as a potential attempt to exfiltrate data. And these are some resources. If you want to know more on our research, we have our Threat Labs blog, we have our Threat Labs report, our Cloud and Threat report. We can obviously also give you a more detailed uh, presentation on our threat protection capabilities. Uh, I have also a personal uh, mail list where basically I share some examples of cloud native threats. They are also published in the Netscope Threat Labs blog. It's called the Cloud Threats Memo. Normally is sent out on a weekly basis. But we have a set of resources to raise the awareness uh, for, the, for the cloud native threats and to educate or organizations on how to be fully protected from these new threats. And that was all from my side. Thank you for your attention. Of course, if you have any questions, we are at your complete disposal. Thanks for that, Paolo. That was uh, definitely very informative and actually, you know, aligns back to, to some of the things that we're seeing on the on, on the bite side. I think that the, the main thing from my side is it's always been a worrying thing that attackers are constantly taking advantage of cloud services that we're trying to implement for productivity and using these to actually craft attacks. Um, but also, you know, from the looks of it, and, and do correct me if I'm wrong here, because I'm definitely not always right, but a majority of these attacks look to steal credentials because attackers don't hack anymore. They log in, they skim credentials, they log in, and then that's when they start, uh, you know, laterally moving. So it's, um, correct. it's, definitely, it's, it's definitely interesting to see what you're seeing lines up to that and, and validates that. It's also, you know, very interesting to see you know how Netscope also aligns to that, and uh, and you know helps solve um, that uh, that challenge and, and issue. In terms of questions, uh, we've had uh, we've had a question come through uh, directly to um, uh, to myself. So this one reads: uh, Please, can you explain how your CTE, uh, which is from what I saw on the other slides, the uh, Cloud Threat Exchange, uh, works? Yeah, absolutely. The, so the CTE, it's a component that is first, it's uh, included in every Netscope uh, license gear for advanced uh, for threat protection. Basically, it's a Docker image that uh, is a kind of mediator for our API and allows bi-directional exchange of threat intelligence. There are a set of plugins available out of the box, including, for example, CrowdStrike. But in case uh, the organization has a specific technology that wants to integrate with Netscope, uh, it is also possible to build uh, custom plugins or to integrate an API feed 
or for example a MISP server via uh, Stix ta Taxi. Uh, depending on the technology, the exchange is bi-directional, as I explained be before. So basically, the Netscope threat intelligence can be enriched with uh, uh, IOCs from the third party, like hashes, URLs, IPs, and, do and do domains. Basically, within a Netscope, you create a custom threat protection profile or a custom category that is fed with uh, the uh, indicators of compromise of the third party. And in the same time, Netscope can also uh, pipe its uh, indicators of compromise, hashes, I, um, IPs, domains, and URLs to the third party. So, for example, if Netscope detects something in the cloud or in the web traffic, uh, uh, this information can be fed to an endpoint technology like CrowdStrike and endpoint can look for the same indicator of compromise within the uh, the base of within the endpoints protected by the solution. Perfect. It's Perfect. very it's very easy to set up and it's basically free because it's included in every licensed tier of our threat protection. Be careful of using the free word, Paolo. We are recording this. <laughs> it's free, provided you have a threat protection license. <laughs> awesome so that's what that's uh, that's what we have for questions so far just before we close down the session i'm just going to quickly reshare um my screen so I just need to make sure that it does share the correct screen there we go it should be coming up again so just before we close down the session just wanted to very quickly talk through um the uh, the cloud risk assessment that Bytes and Netscope have. So Bytes and Net Netscope have effectively, you know, teamed up to provide uh, a cloud risk assessment that looks to uh, deploy Netscope into a dedicated instance, and this allows us to collect information on cloud applications uh, being used. This provides a uh, you know a risk level against your applications, as uh, as Paolo mentioned, and you know it helps to understand how these applications are being uh, being used. So, of course, Paolo has given us some very interesting points today, um, you know, talking us through the risk, the threats, and, 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 and all of that good stuff. He's talked to us, you know, around the, the Netscope solution. So in terms of that, that next step, that engagement, and actually getting more of this into context within your own environment, um, this cloud risk assessment answers exactly that. So if you are interested in run, run this uh, assessment, there is, I think there's a poll up on screen already, which is always good. Um, there is a poll on screen. So, you know, do feel free to uh, to respond to that. Uh, alternatively, if you... Um, if you, uh, if, if, if you said no or send me more information, change your mind or need one urgently, that's always a, always a good one, then you know, please do reach out to your Bytes account manager or uh, to tell me more at bytes.co.uk. I think I've actually put the email address on the next slide. Um, but if you also have any other questions about this session, any other feedback, if you want to have a, have a chat to kick some ideas around or to go through this in more detail, again, please do uh, please do reach out to us. I'll actually flick to the next slide just in case anyone needs to capture down the email address. But I want to thank everyone for their for their attendance and time today. Uh, you know, big thanks to, to Paolo for taking us through that. And um, yeah, we're just a little bit over time, but thank you so much. Enjoy the evening and enjoy the week. Bye.